Belangelo, Beethoven, Mozart, the masters of their time. As for our generation, a violin-making wizard. You create the form, you create the sound. A tailor to the stars. I'm a maker of the best clothing in the world. A jazz virtuoso. The minute I touched the instrument, uh, I knew that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> and an icon in the world of dance. The dancer is music. You know, we're just, we're the notes come to life. These are your modern masters. Hello, I'm Steve Lacey. We are taking a look at four people who have perfected their craft and inspired others with their talents. They all have roots here in New York, and they are considered masters at what they do. We're here in Lincoln Center, where the top musicians in the world perform their craft, and it's people like this violin maker we're about to introduce you to who help make it all possible. I'm Sam Zygmuntovich. I'm a violin maker. I was doing sculpture and artwork from, the, from as little as I can remember. Everyone assumed I would be a sculptor. I thought so myself. I wanted to be Rodin. I read a book about a violin maker when I was 13, and uh, it just caught my imagination. I was pretty much obsessed with instrument making from that point. <laughs> The violin is an amazing instrument. It's given me a, a lifetime of challenge just to try to better what I do. If you actually can see the motions, the violin's twisting, turning, fluctuating. For some of it, it's pumping like a heart. I'm not saying that this wood is actually alive, but it's like it's alive. I've made instruments for Isaac Stern, Joshua Bell, Yo-Yo Ma, Cho Lang Lin, Lilo Josefovich, the Emerson String Quartet. Professional violinists are probably the most highly trained individuals in our society. Uh, we're right up there with, with athletes. They can hear amazingly small distinctions. I had an experience once. I was, uh, a client of mine was trying a number of violins, and we got into Carnegie Hall, and I was sitting in the back of the hall, and on stage there was the musician, and he, there were two Strads, a Guarneri, and my violin. And I was there with a very well-known violin dealer and a couple other experienced listeners, and. None of us knew which was which. And the violin dealer said, well, congratulations. I don't know which is the Strad and which is yours. This is the violin that I, that I made for Isaac Stern in 1991. It was a copy of his Guarneri. Isaac Stern's passed on since then. It's still being played. I'm still taking care of the fiddle. A big part of what I do is uh, adjust instruments for the people who have them from me. And that, that relationship is, is something I really enjoy. It's a great feeling to go to a concert hall and, and hear someone play my violin. Um, on the one hand, it's just fun. On the other hand, I'm kind of listening. It's like, OK, is it loud enough? Is the bass full? Is it projecting? So I'm always kind of li listening with half an ear delay. Every day when I come in here and look at this wood pile, I wonder, you know, who's going first, it or me? <laughs> if this is basically, for me, um, more than a lifetime's worth of wood. You can just feel it when you hold it in your hand, just how how lively it is. You can, I mean, that's just waiting to go. Um, still needs a few more years before I use it. I feel like I've got different people in me. There is um, the artist who actually shapes and carves, and there's the engineer who thinks about the structure, and there is the sound technician who is doing adjustments. It's almost like uh, I feel like those parts of me take, take turns. They don't exist. They, they sort of exist at the same time, but they come out to the surface at different points. At this stage, I'm trying to imagine how this is going to vibrate when it's all together. By feel, by the numbers, and by sound. You can plan as much as you want, but you don't really know until the musician puts the bow down on the string. Making a great violin, or becoming a great violin maker, you could say it's very simple. You just start by making some kind of violin, and then you make the next one a little better, and you figure out what's wrong with that one, and you make the next one a little better. If you have enough time in your life, eventually you will be making a great violin.
Coming up. I'm the happiest when I'm in the factory downstairs watching the world. The iconic tailor, whose clients include the who's who of America's A-listers. Welcome back. We're here in Brooklyn, home to one of the best tailors in the entire world. Martin Greenfield's work has caught the attention of presidents, celebrities, and designers alike. Tonight, Greenfield walks us through his legendary career in his own words. I'm a maker of the best clothing in the world. My name is Martin Greenfield. They call me a tailor. Well, you have to be a tailor before you become a maker. It's a very difficult job, and there aren't too many people left like me. I was 15 and a half when they took me to the concentration camp. My father sat down with me, and he told me, if I don't survive, I don't want you to honor us by crying, honor us by living for the future. And eventually I came to America. Everything that I know was taught to me in this factory. And ask me where I am the happiest. A lot of people will tell you other things, but I'll tell you the truth. I'm the happiest when I'm in the factory downstairs watching the world. Not one tailor makes a whole suit. It takes about a hundred operations on a jacket when you make by hand. Each person has to do a different item perfectly. Look, everything is matched up. Every stripe, every place. When a person comes to buy the first suit from me, he picks the color, I pick the fabric. Why? Because he's going to judge me by the first suit. What I see in our customers when they try on the first suit, it's whoever comes with them, looks at them, and they're shocked to see how beautiful that person looks. because. It makes a difference when you put on something right. There are no two people alike. One is right-handed, one is left-handed, slim one, short one, tall one, extra long. This Patrick Ewing comes is seven feet one. I teach people to make sure whatever we do here has got to be the best in the world because we make everything by hand and I don't think there is any place in the world that could match us. If I listed all the favorite people, then you would have to do a long show. President Clinton, that I was the first time in the White House, I found this closet. I said, this leather jacket, this wet stuff, doesn't work here in Washington. You gotta look like the talking cats, because the minute you walk out on the door, you're on television. And if you get dressed in the morning and you don't follow my advice, Mr. President, can I tell you? You could ruin my reputation. Paul Newman is my favorite. My wife complained one time because he used to come over and kiss me and shake her hands. <laughs> Jimmy Fallon, when he sees me, he goes down on his knees. You see this ring? He, he kisses the ring. I says, I'm not the Pope. I'm just, oh, to me, you're the Pope. <laughs> He's funny guy. Boardwalk Empire, we dressed 130 actors. Every person who watched the show, they talked mostly about the clothing. Yes, that put on. And if he's around 20 years later, the jacket is going to be still good. And this is what I accomplished, quality that you could wear that it almost never goes out of style. Coming up the award-winning jazz bassist whose talent and creativity has inspired generations of music lovers. Oh, oh. 
we're about to find Grammy Award winning bassist Christian McBride here at the Jazz Standard. His career has taken him around the world and back, playing with everybody from the Godfather of Soul, James Brown, to Sting. But as you're about to see, he's known as much for his musical talents as he is for his big heart. <laughs> My name is Christian McBride, and I am a bassist. It's just about letting the energy and, and the spirit flow. When I was eight years old, I saw my father play. For some particular reason, this one concert, uh, it really struck me, and I turned to my mother and I said, uh, can I have a bass for Christmas, uh, a bass guitar? My first electric bass is still in Philly. I, I never brought it to New York with me. The minute I touched the instrument, I knew that's what I wanted to do. That's actually one of the pieces I used to get in the Juilliard. The bass jury was sitting there watching me like this. Just deadpan. No nothing. Didn't know if I was doing good, good or, or bad. The great saxophonist Bobby Watson, uh, maybe two weeks into the school year, he, uh, he found his way into school and he said, hey, what you doing this weekend? I went, I went why? He said, because you know, I got a gig for you this weekend. You know, we're playing at Birdland. I was like, what? I decided to leave Juilliard after one year. I don't regret it because I had a chance to play with some real legends who are, who are no longer with us. Betty Carter, Ray Brown, the late great George Duke, who was a giant influence on me, uh, not just as a musician, but as a person as well. As a young jazz musician, uh, you are expected to know a number of songs from the Great American Songbook. So, I had been in Freddie Hubbard's band for a year and a half. Then Freddie says, hey, we're going to make a live album. I'm like, yes. You know, I'm going to be documented with Freddie Hubbard. So we're recording. Tapes are rolling. Crowd is packed. Freddie starts playing this, this uh, trumpet intro. I don't recognize what he's playing. And right away, I, I, I think I turned white. Since Freddie's back was to me, I took the microphone that was in front of the bass, and I kind of made it drop out of the way so it wouldn't record, <laughs> it wouldn't get the sound of the bass. But at the end of the night, the assistant engineer comes down, he says, you know what? We had a shadow mic on the bass, so we were able to salvage the track. <laughs> and I'm going, no! So yes, on Freddie Hubbard's Live at Fat Tuesdays is a rendition of But Beautiful with me playing all the wrong notes to be documented forever. <laughs> Everything that you, you learn as a trained musician, you have to call on all of those skills to be a jazz musician. And you have to make it all sound simple so the untrained ear can understand it. As a bass player, you are supposed to come up with different creative bass lines every single course. It could be like this, you know. Or I can start it off like this. Or I can start it off like this. Now, when you switch it to the pop side, the discipline is almost the exact opposite. If I may reference my dear friend Sting, we play every breath you take. This is the bass line. I have to keep, I have to play that exactly like that. You know, it's no, none of this, you know. I mean, I could play that, but it would get in the way, and it would, it would really break up the flow of how that song is supposed to feel. 
James Brown has always been my biggest musical influence. I produced what turned out to be his final show at the Hollywood Bowl. He said, uh, son, I'm proud of you. I was like, oh, oh, thank you, Mr. Brown. He said, no, 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 I mean, you really doing some good things, son. I've been following your career. You're doing a lot of good things. You ain't just playing bass. You're upholding the standard. I went, whoa. <laughs> It's sort of a natural inclination to to want to nurture these younger musicians and help them the same way the older guys helped us. So it's all it's all full circle. Coming up, the dance then takes you into what where you're supposed to be. Meet the living legend who is the driving force behind one of the most successful dance companies in the world. It's New York's hot new talent show. Join me and the Bernie Williams Band for the host. Jamison has played an integral role in catapulting this facility into one of the preeminent dance companies of our time. And as we're about to show you, Jamison has been a trailblazer in dance for decades. The dancer is music. You know, where the notes come to life. My name is Judith Jamison. I'm the former artistic director of the Albanelli American Dance Theater. If the dancer is worth their weight, you will see them in motion, life motion, you know, and your breath will be taken away. I was born in 1943. It was a very, very intense time in Philadelphia, artistically, spiritually, uh, emotionally, racially. I was growing up with Mother's Day parades on New Year's Eve with people in blackface. There were things going on there that I'm glad I grew up with. All of those things co colored my career. People ask me sometimes, well, did you know you wanted to be a dancer? It, it wasn't a matter of wanting to be a dancer. It's something that you needed to be. I needed to be a dancer. I didn't know that, but it came to me. There are always people before you that just inch the door open a little bit more so that you could get a foot in. Alvin Ailey gave that to all of us because we're living on his afterburn. All the the good things that he did for us so that we can exist now. And it continues. Girl, ah. Bravo. There it is, there it is. Right. To be back to you. Mr. Haley and I met uh, in 1965. He was there at this audition that Donnie McHale was giving. And uh, I failed that audition because I was really bad. I hadn't danced for three months because I was working at the World's Fair, right? Pushing buttons at the log flume ride. Don't ask. So as I was leaving the building, there was a man sitting on the steps. But I was so upset, I walked past him. And about three days later, that man that I passed on the steps called me and said, would you like to be a member of the Alvin Ailey American Dance? You know, this is how... You know you're guided. You just know you're guided. I was one of Mr. Ailey's muses. He had several muses. There's a history there that's, that's quite wonderful. And some of the ballets are still being done, like Cry, which is this one. Mother, 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 save your child. 15, 16 minutes solo. That's uh, very difficult to do. So once the curtain went down and, I, and there was thunderous applause and people kept applauding and kept applauding, that opened all kinds of doors. I'm so proud of not just this generation, but the generation before them and the generation before that that I was responsible for, making them lift themselves even higher than they thought they could. The point is, to have a connection with your soul and to hopefully connect with someone else's. Will they remember you just for how high your leg went or how many pirouettes you did? Or will they be touched in the innermost part of their being? That's what dance is supposed to do. That's what the arts are supposed to do for you.
Thanks for joining us for our Fox 5 special on Modern Masters. I'm Steve Lacey. Have a great night.